What makes capitalism distinctive is that it's organized around and dependent on perpetual growth. It's the first and only economic system in human history that is intrinsically expansionary. If it doesn't grow, it collapses into crisis, triggering recessions. People lose their jobs, poverty goes up, inequality rises, and so on. So we have to keep the, the gross domestic product, the GDP, growing at a rate of 3% per year. Now, this might seem like a small increments because we're used to thinking of growth in linear terms. But remember, this is a compounding exponential function. And during the COVID pandemic, we've all learned how dangerous exponential functions can become. Now, this might not be a problem if GDP was just plucked out of thin air, but it's not. It requires resources and energy. So the more the economy grows, the more resource and energy it chews up. And this is what's driving ecological breakdown. Yeb Sano was right. So I want to, I want to show you just a couple of slides here to illustrate um, a few key points, if I can. Uh, so this is um, a graph that shows you two lines. One is uh, global resource use in, in, in black there. And the other line is global GDP. Okay. Now, what, what this demonstrates is a very tight coupling between uh, GDP growth and resource use. There was talk a couple of decades ago about the possibility of green growth, whereby GDP would keep going up while resource use fell, but that hasn't happened. In fact, resource use has been rising at a faster pace than GDP. Um, and this gives you a sense for kind of where we're at globally right now. The red line you see is what scientists consider to be the safe, sustainable boundary for resource use. And as you can see, we blew past that boundary in the 1990s, and things have only accelerated since then. This is what is, is driving the ecological breakdown that we're seeing all around us. Okay? Now, crucially, um, not all nations are equally responsible for this crisis. Um, here we have uh, the per capita sustainable threshold in red here. And low, low income countries over here, and low, lower middle income countries right here, consume very little actually, only about two to three tons of stuff per person. Um, whereas high income nations over here consume vastly in excess of the sustainable boundary, um, about 28 tons of material stuff per person per year. Um, uh, high income nations are, uh, are almost the sole drivers of the ecological breakdown that our planet is experiencing, um, even though most of it harms the global south, the poor countries of, of the global south most. Something is true also of, of climate change. Um, this graph shows you uh, who has contributed most to excess emissions um, over the past couple hundred years. And what we see is that the USA is single-handedly responsible for 40% of the emissions that are causing climate breakdown, the EU for 29%, the global north uh, as a group for 92%, and the, in all of the regions of the global south, Africa, Asia, and Latin America are responsible for only 8% of those emissions. And yet, the, the consequences of climate breakdown affect the global south um, most brutally. So what we're dealing with here is also um, a crisis that has col clear colonial dimensions that we need to pay attention to. So how do we resolve this? What do we do? Well, we, we know what has to happen. Um, global emissions have to uh, fall by, uh, by 50% in the next 10 years um, and reach zero by the middle of the century in order for us to stay under 1.5 degrees. Crucially, because high income nations have contributed the vast majority of historical emissions, they have to do it much faster, reaching zero by 2030, uh, right at the latest, in order to be just about that. So um, the question is, is it possible for us to do this? Is it possible for us to transition to 100% renewable energy and reverse ecological breakdown in the short time that we have left? Fortunately, the answer is yes, but not if we continue to pursue economic growth at the usual rates. In fact, we need a completely different approach. High income nations, as we've seen, need to significantly reduce their use of resources and energy. So this is what um, we refer to as degrowth. And it's an idea that's been getting a lot of steam among scientists and social movements in the past few years. Degrowth is a planned reduction of resource and energy use in high income nations designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a safe, just, and equitable way. And the core claim of degrowth is that high income nations don't need more growth to deliver uh, flourishing lives and high levels of well being for all. So, what does this look like in reality? Well, the dominant assumption in economics right now is that all sectors of the economy must grow all the time, regardless of whether we actually need them. Uh, but this is a socially and ecologically irrational way to run an economy. Instead, we should have an open conversation 
about what parts of the economy we actually want to expand, things like public health care, renewable energy, public transportation, and so on, and what parts are clearly destructive and need to be scaled down, things like the arms industry, SUVs, private jets, fast fashion, industrial beef, advertising, and so on. Um, of course, the reason we don't do this is because of the specter of unemployment. If we scale down, if we take the rational step of scaling down less necessary parts of the economy, there will be fewer jobs, and obviously we need jobs in order to survive in our economic system. In, in fact, the, ma the main reason we all line up behind the growth agenda is because we always need more jobs. But this is not the only solution. An alternative approach is to shorten the working week and distribute necessary labor more evenly. We don't need more jobs, we need a better distribution of work. And the exciting thing is that shortening the working week has been shown to have significant positive impact on people's health, happiness, and well being. We also need to significantly reduce inequality. We're often told that we need growth to create more income and improve people's lives. But in rich countries like Britain, the problem isn't that there's a deficit of income. The problem is that it's all captured at the top. The key thing to grasp here is that we can solve our social problems right now simply by sharing what we already have more fairly rather than plundering the earth for more. At the same time, we need to expand universal public services, not just healthcare and education, but transportation, affordable housing, energy, and internet, so that everyone can have access to the resources they need to live good lives without requiring high levels of private income in order to do so. So the exciting thing is that it's 100% possible for us to, to, to do this, to scale down excess resource use, um, take pressure off of the global south, reverse ecological damage, while at the same time building a flourishing society, one that is more just and more caring. But it requires breaking free from the shackles of growthism. And that is difficult to do because for decades we've been taught that growth is the only way. It's so deeply embedded in our ideology that we rarely think to question it. But question it we must. And when we do, exciting new possibilities open up. So in this book, Less is More, my goal is to take readers on a journey telling the story of how we came to see the world as we do today and what a different way of being might look like. Thanks very much. <laughs>